Welcome to you all this Lord's Day, in the name of the Father, who has set eternity in our hearts, in the name of the Son, who values us above many sparrows, and in the name of the Spirit, who helps us to praise our Creator. Let me just make a few announcements before we commence worship. We hope to meet again this evening, God willing, at half past six on Zoom, and to spend some time in prayer for different aspects of the work in our world. Then on Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. we hope to have a session meeting, and uh, I'm not sure how I haven't spoken to you. Are the ladies hoping to have a Bible study on Thursday? Yeah. At quarter to eight. Quarter to eight. Four eight. Yeah. Okay. So that's Thursday evening. All the ladies. Uh, Bible study, please do, do remember that. Uh, and then next Lord's Day, God willing, we come around the table that Jesus has set in place. Now at the moment we're not terribly sure where we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper. Uh, I was talking to the girls this morning. They're not clear as to when folk are occupying this room. So we don't know if we're going to be here or in the bar. I think that those are the two choices, but we will let you know during the week. Uh, that's that's our plan anyway, and we'll let you know where, where we'll meet and also when we'll meet. So obviously that will be for members of Gateway Christian Fellowship, with other folk welcome to observe. I think that's all the announcements. The psalmist cries out in praise of God in the psalm that we come to today. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. We come to praise the God of all the world as we would sing together part of Psalm 97 on page 230. We're going to sing stanzas 1 to 3 and then stanzas 6 and 7 to the tune Ernan number 12. And this psalm lets us know just who God is. He is majestic. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. He's in charge of the distant shores. All distant shores their joy make known. There's something mysterious about God. The third line tells us clouds and thick darkness him surround. But there is much that is clear and helpful. On truth and justice stands his throne. And as we sing stanza six, that reminds us that God is supreme. He is really the only one God. Other people may think that there are other gods, but that's not true. And he is also a moral God who loved the Lord, must wrong, reject. Everything that God does is right. And he wants us to be the same. Sad to say there will be conflict for those who love God and who are living for him. It talks about the wicked at the end of stanza six. But God will bring those who trust his name through to the end, those who are righteous. The last lines, be glad you righteous in the Lord. Thanks to his holy name in part. God will give us victory just as he gave his son Jesus victory from the dead. So Psalm 97 stands as 1 to 3 and 6 and 7. Let's stand and praise God. <laughs> Thank you. 
together. Our Father, we praise you for those words we've just been singing. You reign, and you alone reign. And that is enough for us. Indeed, it's enough for all the earth to rejoice. Father, we come to talk to you now through the one through whom you made this world, through Jesus, who is the living word. And we do thank you for more bright and sunny days this past week. Not as warm as the previous week, but we can still see signs of the world around us waking up. We can hear the birds singing. We can see the daffodils growing. We can see new life in the fields, new lambs that have recently been born. Father, we thank you that you are in charge in New Zealand, in India, in China, in Malaysia, in America, in Ethiopia, in France, and in Ireland. Not one of these countries is under the power of some rival God. And as we have been singing, we thank you that you are a God of mystery. You are surrounded by clouds and thick darkness. We don't know everything about you because you are God and we are not. But you have told us enough so that we can trust you at all times. Your throne is founded on truth and justice. Yet, Father, we need to confess our sins to you today. We would rather not do that. But your word tells us that if we pretend we have no sin, We're only fooling ourselves. The truth is not in us. Forgive us if we think there are other forces in this world that might topple you. Forgive us if we think too much of your power and not enough of your love. Forgive us too, Father, if we claim to love you, but don't quickly enough reject what we know is wrong. Forgive us if we play with sin instead of turning our backs on it. We thank you that as this psalm tells us, you are righteous, you are joyful, you are holy, and you are loving. We do pray that you would help us to be more like you through your spirit whom you give us. And Father, we do praise you for Jesus today. We thank you that Jesus came to make you known. We thank you that he loved you with all his heart, that he loves you still with his whole heart. We thank you that he was so prepared to have all our wrong loaded onto him on the cross so that it may be taken from us, so that instead we may have your spirit we may have hope and joy 
and eternal life. And we do thank you, Father, that the risen Jesus guards the souls of all believers, even as he prays for every believer today. We do pray as we meet together around your word that you will speak to us of your care for us. And we do pray that you would help us to respond by willingly and unreservedly giving ourselves to you. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 104. Psalm 104. It's on page 656 of the Maroon Bibles. And last week we were really looking at the first nine verses. So we're going to read from verse 10 to the end of the psalm today. Psalm 104, reading from verse 10. Just a few things to be looking for as we read through these verses. What is God doing in verses 10 to 15? What's he doing? Because he's doing something slightly different in verses 16 to 18. And what's he doing in verses 19 to 23? What is the overall message of these verses? And are you seeking to respond to what he's telling us to do towards the end of the psalm. So Psalm 104, reading from verse 10. This is God's word. He, that is God, makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the air nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread that sustains his heart. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. There the birds make their nests. The stork has its home in the pine trees. The high mountains belong to the wild goats. The crags are a refuge for the conies, or the rock badgers in other versions. The moon marks off the seasons, and the sun knows where to go down, when to go down. You bring darkness, it becomes night, and all the beasts of the forest prowl. The lions roar for their prey, and seek their food from God. The sun rises, and they steal away, they return and lie down in their dens. Then man goes out to his work, to his labour until evening. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and the Leviathan, which you formed to frolic there. These all look to you, to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. 
but may sinners vanish from the earth, and the wicked be no more. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Amen. And please turn over with me to the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and chapter 5, just a few verses from the beginning of chapter 5. And could I ask Samuel and Thomas and Lydia to listen to these verses especially and see if you can pick out the two different animals that we're going to be reading of. We're going to talk about them in a minute or two. Revelation chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Then I, and that's John, this is John who's speaking, saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, and sealed with seven seals. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And then reading at verse 9, everyone singing a song in praise of the Lamb. And they sang a new song, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Amen. May God bless to us these readings and also the preaching of his own perfect and powerful truth. Just keep that passage open at Revelation. Let's just talk for a minute or two about what we were thinking about last week. Remember who this is from last week? Mr. Happy, that's right, Thomas, Mr. Happy. And you remember how Mr. Happy was actually able to make Mr. Miserable happy as well whenever Mr. Miserable came to live with him. So that's Mr. Happy. Can you remember any of the words about the people that Jesus says are happy? Happy are the, and then there's four different words that he uses. Most of them are quite short words. Poor, that's right, Samuel, that's very good. You remember any other ones? Rich. Not rich, not rich. Poor is right. If you don't have very much food, what are you? You need some food, you're hungry. Yes, Thomas, I hear you. Yes, hungry. So I'll show you the four words poor. Sad, humble, and hungry. And those are the kinds of people that Jesus is looking for. It doesn't mean poor because you have no money. It means poor because you realize that you're not worthy to be with Jesus. It's only because of Jesus that your sin can be forgiven. And that's what makes you sad. You're sad for your sin. You're sorry for the things that you've done that you shouldn't have done. And then you're humble, you're wanting to serve others. That's what Jesus was like himself. And he wants all those who trust in him to be the same way. 
and you're hungry. You're hungry for the good things that only Jesus can give you. Righteousness, goodness, purity, so that you can be straight and so that other people can trust you. So do try to remember those things because those are important things that Jesus says. Happy are the poor. Happy are the sad. Sounds strange. But if you're sad for your sin, happy are the humble. Happy are the hungry. Those who are hungry for the good things that Jesus can give. Like purity and righteousness and goodness. Okay? That's just last week. I want to talk about something a wee bit different today. Do you like lions? Samuel, do you? Okay. Have you ever seen a real lion in real life? You ever been to the zoo? Yes. I can remember we were at the zoo many, many years ago. And our Peter wanted to go very near to the lions. And he got as close as he possibly could. Now, there was still a big fence between him and the, it was a lioness. And he was calling the lioness Sarabi because he was thinking of the Lion King. And he was wanting to get as close to her as he could. And I wanted to try and get him back. So I had to make sure he didn't go any further. That he came back to us. Because the lioness wouldn't, I don't think, have let him stroke her. Because unfortunately, that's not the way lions are today. Lions are fierce. You know when lions hunt? What time of the day lions hunt? Thomas, that is correct. Night time, that's actually what we were reading about in that other passage, about how the lions are up in the night and the lions are hunting, not, not just at night, but a lot of the time they do their hunting at night. We were reading in the book of Revelation about a scroll, and a scroll was the kind of book that they had in those days. It was just like one big long piece of paper that they would roll up. And this was a scroll that was rolled up and was sealed so that no one could open it. They had things stuck on it to make sure that no one could open it. And this particular scroll has the names of all believers in Jesus on it. And it also has what's going to happen at the end of the world on it. So it's a very special scroll. And no one can open the scroll. And John is heartbroken because no one can find out these really important things. But then one of the elders says to John, Don't weep, John. The Lion of Judah has triumphed. I wonder if he's a lion like that. That's a beautiful lion. But oh, he's also fierce. And that's what's true about lions. Lions are strong. Lions are called the king of the jungle because they're the ones who can beat most of the other animals in a fight. The lion of Judah has triumphed. That means, who do you think the lion of Judah is, Samuel? What person in the Bible do you think that is? Jesus. That's one of the names for Jesus. He is the Lion of Judah. He was born into the tribe of Judah. That's his particular tribe. And he's a lion that tells us how strong he is and how he can defeat all his enemies and all our enemies. Like sin, like death. Death is the worst thing, but death couldn't defeat him. Like Satan. So he is the lion to defeat all those things. So the elder says... To John, look for a lion, John, because he's the one who can open the scroll. But whenever we actually read in the Bible, it doesn't say that John saw a lion. Let me just read what it says. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. And that's another side of who Jesus is. Yes, Jesus is the Lion of Judah, 
but he's also the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is strong and can defeat all his enemies, but Jesus is also a servant who has given his perfect life in order that our sin might be taken away, in order that we might be pure the way that he wants us to be. So if you remember those two things about Jesus, you know a lot about who Jesus is, that he is the Lion of Judah, that he has beaten all his enemies, but he's also the Lamb of God who takes away all the sin of all his people. And he wants us to trust him, and he wants us to be the same. If we have Jesus' Spirit living in us, then hopefully we'll be strong to do what's right and not be tempted by what's wrong. But hope, hopefully we'll also be servants to want to let other people know about Jesus so that they can trust in him too. So thank you for listening. And thank you for answering so well. Do remember those two sides of who Jesus is. There's many other names he has, but two, those are two of the most important. And what we're going to sing now from Psalm 34 actually mentions lions in it. Not the most important part, but it does mention lions. We're going to sing Psalm 34, stanzas 5 to 8. And then, that's on page 663, we're going to sing to the tune Grafenberg, number 94. And we have an invitation from God in stanza 5. O taste and see the Lord is good. God wants us to come to him, to confess our sin to him, to fear him, to respect him, because he is so great and so holy. And then stanza 6 is talking about the lions. The lions young may hungry be, and they may lack their food. But those who truly seek the Lord will not lack any good. God feeds the lions. And God feeds everyone who trusts in him, not just with our daily food, but with righteousness and goodness as well. And that's why he wants us to trust him, to listen to him, to do good, to seek peace, and to pursue the truth, which is Jesus. So Psalm 34 stands as 5 to 8. Let's again stand and praise God. See the Lord is good, who trust in him is best. Fear him, his saints, those who him fear, will be with one distress. The lions young may hungry be, and they may lack their those who truly seek the Lord will not lack any good. O oh, come, my sons, and listen, I do teach the Lord to fear. Who longs for life and length of days, that he may see good here. Back your tongue from evil words, your lips from speaking God. Depart from evil and do good, seek peace, pursue it still. Let's remain standing as again we come to God in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the pictures that you give us in your word not pictures on paper or pictures on canvas like a painting, but pictures in our minds. We thank you that Jesus is the Lion of Judah, that he is powerful to defeat all his and all our enemies. But we thank you too that Jesus is your own precious Lamb, that he gave his life, his perfect life, to pay for the sins of the world, to pay for all the sins 
of every person who would ever believe in him. And Father, we pray that you would help us, that you would help even the smallest here, like Lydia and Thomas and Samuel. Help us all to know that there is sin in our lives. Help us to know that we cannot remove that sin. But help us to believe that Jesus has done all that's necessary in his perfect life and in the depths of his death to set us free from all our sin. Indeed, to declare us actually righteous in your sight. And Father, we pray that you would help us to live by faith in these great things every day so that we may be strong for you and so that we may be servants of others just as Jesus has been for us. Father, we want to pray for the theological students this week during this week of exams. We do thank you that the classes are over. We thank you that much ground has been covered. We pray that you would be with both Kenny and Johnny as they would seek to remember what they've been learning this past year from the New Testament on Tuesday and from systematic theology on Thursday. And Father, we pray that they would not just see this as information to be remembered, but rather as wisdom to shape their lives and to shape the lives of those to whom they'll preach, those whom they will pastor in the future in your will. And Father, we want to pray this week too for Paul Wallace as he would be ordained and installed into the congregation of Breathing. Be with those from the presbytery taking part in that service. We do pray that it would be a meaningful service, especially for Paul and for the folk in Breathing. We do pray that you will use Paul and that you will use Elaine too and their family in Brady to bring glory to your son Jesus, to bring unbelievers to faith and to bring believers to maturity. Our Father, we pray that you'd be with us now as we would turn to your word. We do pray that your word, as we study it together, would have an effect on our lives from day to day, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And please do have your Bibles open at Psalm 104 as we look at the second half of this psalm together. Psalm 104, page 656. Praise the Lord, O my soul. That's how the psalm starts. That's how it finishes. That's how the previous psalm starts and finishes too. I said last week that by using those words, the psalmist is seeking to stir himself up. Because of sin in our hearts, praising doesn't come naturally to us. But God wants us to praise him. For heaven is a world of love and a world of praise. And God wants us to get some practice in while we're living in this world before we go to heaven. Praising him for rescuing us and saving us. That's what Psalm 103 is all about. Praising him for making us and looking after us. That's what Psalm 104 is about. The title I want to give this sermon is Our Caring Creator. Our Caring Creator. Some of you may have a book with that title, The Caring Creator. And this tells us about God's care. So I would just encourage you to use these verses in this psalm 
to marvel at God's creation. Use this psalm to praise God for his care. Let me just remind you what we saw last week. Because in the whole psalm, there are three reasons to praise God. The first of them we saw last week is because he's the God of the cosmos. He is so great and so majestic. If you look at the beginning of it in verse 2, the limitless heavens are just like a tent to God. That's the way he stretches them out. It gives us a sense of his power and of his signs. Don't make any pictures of God because God has told us not to. But do examine these pictures in words that he has given us. So he is the God of the cosmos. That's one reason for praise. And then secondly, the control of this God. What he said that first creation week happened. Just as he said it. And he has been holding everything in place since then. He is a wraparound God. Unlike so many other religions, there are no other gods in view here, competing with him. You look at verses 5 to 9, those are just emphasizing God's control. So we can go to God with everything. Because he is the only God who's there. And much of the rest of the psalm gives us the third reason to praise him. The God of the cosmos, the control of this God, and then today looking at the care of this God. He is our caring creator. Verses 10 to 15 show us the care he takes over food and drink. God provides our food and drink. And in these verses, from verse 10 to verse 15, everything is happening as it should. The rivers follow their courses. The birds sing. The earth is satisfying. Do rivers ever amaze you? They do me especially driving along in the countryside, maybe even driving along, you weren't expecting to come across a river. And then suddenly there's a river alongside the road. The river looks pretty much level with the land. But it's actually a long hollow that God has dug out in order to water the land, in order to give the animals drink. And with big rivers... It can even provide power. Not only does God look after drink, he takes care of food as well. Look at verse 14. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread that sustains his heart. Did you ever think how much God does every year? I think we can certainly see it, especially at this time of the year. I do remember one plant I cut down a few years ago, almost to the roots. And then the next year, there was about three feet of growth on its long leaves, just in a year. Every spring, God fills the hedgerows with leaves. He fills the trees with blossom. He fills the fields with barley and wheat. He ripens the fruit on the trees. There's not one plant or bush or tree in your garden that you have grown from nothing. You had to have seeds or something, a seedling to start with. God always gives it a start for you. As verse 14 rightly says, he makes plants for man to cultivate. He makes the plants, we do the cultivating. What have you eaten today? Or what will you be eating for Sunday dinner? 
that you have not received from the hand of a generous, caring God. I know some people, instead of eating to live, live to eat. You can sometimes see that. But God does mean us to enjoy our food. Since he gives so generously, we are to receive gratefully. We're not to be Ebenezer Scrooges hoarding what God has given us, thumbing our noses at the world, not sharing what we have. That's what verse 15 is all about. These simple but precious gifts lighten up our lives. Wine that gladdens the heart of man, oil, probably olive oil, so precious and serviceable in ancient Israel and today as well. And bread, a dizzying array of breads in the shops, if you choose not to bake your own. And these things should make us praise the Father of lights, the God of all good gifts, who showers these things on us. That's something of the tragedy of France, you know, that God has given the French such a beautiful, fertile country. And probably only one in a thousand pauses to thank God for it, to give his life, to give her life to him. One further little detail from this section, I heard another minister mention, going back to verse 11. It says, they give water to all the beasts of the field, the wild donkeys quench their thirst. And the preacher said, with tongue in cheek, that he wondered which husbands some cold, wet night in November would go over to the kitchen window and look out and sigh, I wonder how the wild donkeys are doing tonight. We don't really care for the wild donkeys. They look after themselves. We don't expect anything from them. They're wild. But God cares enough to quench their thirst. Indeed, I, I often notice, if I might for a walk along Northland Road, that God is using water in a different way. He often washes the pavement clean when nearby birds have been around. Does he not care more than we do? Does he not care much more for you and me? As Jesus said, his eye is on the sparrow. He's watching over us. So can we not trust him with our lives? God provides food and drink. In verses 16 to 18, we see God's care in a place to live. God controls a place to live. That's what's so good about being able to go up on a plane. You can get a different perspective on things. Maybe some of you, maybe most of us haven't been up recently. But from the air, everything, especially in the countryside, looks as if it's been planned. Looks like one large model. A field of sheep, and then a field of cows, and then a meadow with half a dozen horses in it, and then several neat little bungalows in a row. It's like the farms you used to make when you were a child. Obviously, man is responsible for part of that, but isn't he just copying God in his order, in his planning? God has a place for everything. Those trees, that verse 16 talks about, that dot the landscape, are home to all kinds of birds and animals. I was watching a documentary the other day about the great Zambezi River in Central Africa. In the 1950s, they built the Kariba Dam on the Zambezi River in order to harness the river's power. And then behind the dam, the land flooded, producing Lake Kariba and drowning many of the trees there. But the tops of the trees are still visible and 500 pairs of African fish eagles are still able to nest in those trees 
even though the trees are now in the middle of a lake. Verse 18 talks about the high mountains. You may not be very interested in the high mountains. We don't have many in this land. But that's what God has set aside for the wild goats. The high mountains belong to the wild goats. And nowadays we have wildlife cameramen who can spend time there and record for us the lives of the animals in those barren places so that we can see that what Psalm 104 says is actually true. And Isaiah even uses a picture like this of some animal, probably a mountain goat, riding on the heights of the earth to speak in Isaiah 58 of the privileged, lofty, steady position of those who call this day, who call the Sabbath, a delight. So God uses these pictures from the world to speak about his kingdom. And don't these verses tell us, verses 16 to 18, don't they tell us that where we live now is no accident? God has provided it. Trees for the birds, pine trees for the storks, high mountains for the goats, rocky crags for the wild badgers. A place for everything, everything in its place. God is a God of order and neatness. As the Apostle Paul says to those people he was talking to in Athens, unbelievers, though they thought they were cultured, from one man God made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the exact places where they should live. And what's more, for those who love him, Jesus has gone on ahead to prepare a place beyond our imagination. God provides food and drink. He organizes a place to live. And then in verses 19 to 23, we see God's care. God has a time for everything. God has a time for everything. According to verse 19, that's what the sun and moon are. The moon marks off the seasons and the sun knows when to go down. So they're not some kind of object for us to worship. They're created bodies. They're there to tell us the times and the seasons. Do you know when the next new moon is? Anybody any idea when the next new moon is? Not, not yet May. May will be the one after that. The next new moon is the 16th of April. And that's the day before Easter Day. Easter always coincides with Passover. And Passover is always a new moon. So the moon is still marking out special times for us. And the sun knows when to go down. That's not as early these days as the evenings fill with light, as the sun rises earlier in the morning, as the whole hemisphere, if you can say whole hemisphere, wakes up after its winter slumber. There's a time for the wild beasts to be on the prime. That's what verse 20 is talking about. We were watching a wildlife film yesterday, which with special heat-adapted infrared cameras, it can show a lioness hunting in the dark. That's their time. That's why they spend so much of the daytime resting. With us, it's the other way around. Look at verse 22. The sun rises and they, that's the animals, the lions particularly steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. Then man goes out to his work, to his labor until evening. Obviously, we don't have lions roaming 
the fields, the gardens of Derry. But there may well have been lions not far from where the psalmist is writing. He gets up just as the lions are going to bed. So thankfully one never meets the other. We need our sleep. But God never sleeps. He's busy providing for the lions when we are fast asleep. He has a time for everything. These days, nature is red in tooth and claw. If you visit a wildlife park, you have to keep the doors and windows of your car closed when you're told to. There was a time when Adam could have patted a lion or a tiger or a dinosaur. Since the fall, animals have defense and attack systems, which they didn't have before. But even though sin has disrupted God's world, God is still caring for him. And it seems that the lions in verse 21 are better theologians than many evolutionists. They seek their food from God. They know God provides their food. It's not just presented to them on a platter. They have to go looking for it. They have to hunt it down. But the bigger point is that God is at work in the darkness, just as in the light. Verse 20, you bring darkness, it becomes night. This is something that God controls, and that should bring us great comfort. I think most of us do have a natural fear of the night, which according to John's gospel, evil men love because their deeds are evil, because their deeds are wicked. I still remember going up to Belfast about midnight to help a released prisoner who was in fear for his life. And we walked some of the streets near the university in Belfast. And eerily, after midnight, these streets were just as packed as if it had been midday. But look again at what verse 20 says. You bring darkness. It becomes night. So even when it goes dark at midday, above the cross of Jesus, we need not fear, believer. God is in control even of that darkness, even when his son is abandoned. God is caring for his people then too, at that time of untold suffering. Praise him our times, all our times, noonday, the wee small hours when unpleasant thoughts can invade, the good times and the very hard times are all in his hands. God provides food and drink. God controls a place to live. God has a time for everything. And then in verses 24 to 30, the psalmist is starting to draw the whole thing together. And these verses tell us that we are totally dependent on God. We are totally dependent on God. Obviously, no enormous hands surround the earth like that. It's a pictorial way of letting us see that the whole world is under God's control. We're totally dependent on God for everything. In verses 25 and 26, he takes us out to sea. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and the Leviathan, which you formed to frolic there. And we can do that even more thrillingly these days. Have you ever flown over the sea and actually watched it, rather than just drifting off to sleep because there wasn't much to see? Of course, we can't look below the surface to see some of these countless teeming creatures that verse 25 talks of. But it doesn't take a whole lot of thinking to see the psalmist's point here 
the sea is not our domain. Only a few ships creep across its surface at wide intervals. But God is completely at home there. He has made the sea. He has made what's in the depths where light can't even penetrate. And I love that reference to Leviathan. Some of the pagan religions of the ancient Near East believed in monsters from the deep that might seek to take over the world. And to them, to those people who believed those things, the sea itself was a threat. These mighty beasts, bigger than blue whales, they posed a great threat too. I believe the Leviathan was most likely a sea serpent or a giant swimming dinosaur, not just a shark or a whale. And I think if you have an ESV, the reading at the foot of the page in the ESV is better than what we have in the text. What we have in the text is, and the Leviathan, which you formed to frolic there. The ESV has the Leviathan, which you formed to play with. In other words, the greatest and most fearsome creature in the ocean is just God's big toy. This lets us see that God delights in his creation, that God enjoys the world he has made, that God involves himself in this world, that God rejoices over his children with singing. And these creatures depend on God just like you and I do. Look at verse 27. These all look to you to give them their food at the proper time. The two questions constantly in my wife's mind are what shall I make for lunch and what shall I make for tea? But can you imagine how much more enormous God's food preparation is? He is to feed all the fish in the sea, never mind all the, the, the land animals, never mind us. And he starts from scratch. In verses 28 to 30, God is taking the initiative in every area. His provision of food and favor and breath is so consistent that our hearts don't even miss a beat. Every breath comes from him. All he needs to do for us no longer to be alive is to withdraw that breath. Truly in him and through him we live and move and laugh and cry and think and pray. Should not more of that living and moving and thinking and praying be done consciously towards him? After all, as it says in verse 30, when he sends forth his spirit into the lives of sinners, we are remade in the image of his son. So let's just come to the end of it all. What does it all add up to? What a fantastic panorama of God's care we have in this psalm. He gives us and all creatures our food and drink, far more than we can ever manage. He determines the place where and decides the time when we live. We depend on him for everything. Truly, he is a God to honor and adore. Apparently, when Lady Jane Grey, the nine-day queen of England, was under sentence of death, she quoted two of these verses to a churchman who had lapsed from his faith. If you look at verse 29, the second part of verse 29 and verse 13, and this is a slightly older translation. 
She said to him, When thou takest away thy spirit, O Lord, from men, they die and are turned again to their dust. But when thou lettest thy breath go forth, they shall be made, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Now, whether she was writing to the churchman or whether she was writing to encourage herself, she said, fight manfully, come life, come death. The quarrel is God's, and undoubtedly the victory is ours. So she died trusting Christ. Verse 24 is really a summary of the second part of the psalm. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. It talks about the wisdom of God's works. There may be times when we doubt that. When because of sadness or disappointment coming into our lives, we're not sure what God's doing. But the psalmist here is reasoning with us. Just as God comes in to reason with Job at the end of that book. And the psalmist has shown us some of God's majesty. He's shown us much of God's control. He's given us many examples of God's care. He doesn't do things by halves. He doesn't leave projects half finished. There is wisdom in everything he does. Even if we don't always see it straight away. His message to you and to me, to every human being we come into contact with, is this. If I take such care over short-lived animals, some the creatures of a day or a month or a decade, how much more do I care for you who will live forever? We have the creation of man or the recreation of man in verse 30. And then it seems the psalmist does what God did on the seventh day. He stands back from creation and pronounces his verdict in verse 31. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He wants to bring glory and honor to God. By this God, as verse 32 says, even the mountains may crumble. Even this earth will give away. So don't worship creation. Praise God. Like the psalmist from within, your whole life long in verse 33. Spend time studying his creation. The colors the complexity, the intricacy, the size, the order. Yes, creation has been subjected to frustration, as Paul says. But imagine what kind of a world God is preparing for those who love him, which will be like the paradise of Eden, except that we can't lose the new world because Jesus has guaranteed it with his blood. It was one of the strokes of genius of C.S. Lewis in his book, The Great Divorce, that he portrayed creation in the new world, not as more dreamy and ethereal than this one, but as more real, more bright, more full of substance and potential. <coughs> What new worlds does God have in mind for those who put him first? Yes, as the last verse indicates, sin has scarred this planet. We were talking a little about this last Lord's Day evening. Sin has invaded each one of our lives. Sin that goes deeper and broader than we would care to admit. We may bear the pain of those scars all our days on earth but not all our days. God does want the birds to praise him. That's pleasant. He does want the lions to growl their thanks. He does laugh when Leviathan turns a cartwheel. 
But what he wants more than anything is for you, if your life has been remade with Jesus as your Savior, for you to say and to mean, verse 33, I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Let's stand and talk to him together. Our Father, we do thank you for your care. We've been thinking a little bit about that today. It is more thorough, it is more constant, it is more comprehensive than we could ever think possible. It takes us indeed, your care takes us from this world to your own home. Our Father, we thank you for your wisdom. It is beyond our minds. Your foolishness is wiser than men's wisdom. We do pray that you would help us to study your world as your believing people, finding in your world evidences of your care, of your love, of your desire for men and women and boys and girls to share eternity, praising you. May sinners vanish from the earth because so many are coming under your sway and you're changing them, you're changing us from sinners to saints through your own Son, our Saviour. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We close our service by singing part of Psalm 104 together. Psalm 104 on page 251. We're going to sing stanzas 21 to 26 to the tune Richmond 135. Beginning to sing about the sea, which is foreign to us, but not to God. Creation in all its aspects brings God glory. And these stanzas tell us just in, in so many ways how God provides for all. He is sovereign over life and death. He is renewing the world. May you know him renewing your spirit as you trust in him, as you live for his son Jesus. Those last couple of, of lines in stanza 26. So in your great power you renew the face of all the earth. May you know that renewing power of God's spirit in your own life. Psalm 104 from stanza 21 to 26. Let's praise God. Oh. Uh -huh. 
Fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. <laughs>